So you think you may want to try using a classic car as your daily driver. Judging by the comments that we got on the several videos we've done recently on modern technology, modern cars, and how it's really run amok, the $5,600 Ford F-150 tail light repair, the $41,000 Rivian Dent. Judging by the comments on those videos, and there were thousands and thousands of them of people who agreed with what I was saying, that it's gone too far. There were also many, many comments where people were like, yeah, you know what, I'm done with anything modern. My next car or truck is going to be a fill in the blank from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. People are looking at classic cars. The idea of using a classic car as a daily driver. It's not for everybody. There's a lot of work involved in stuff like this because keeping an old car on the road, keeping an old car alive and reliably functioning is kind of a job on its own. But you know, you're a car guy. You wouldn't be watching this channel. So you're up for that challenge. But the bottom line is this. Modern cars have become disposable. They've become appliances. Yes, they have a lot of virtues. They're fast. They're efficient. They're comfortable. They have all the bells and whistles and gadgets. But they're disposable. It's hard to love something that's disposable. We're car people. We love cars. We don't just look at them as an appliance. It's something we want to work with. We bond with these things. We identify with them. We put ourselves into them. You don't do that with a toaster, you know what I mean? It's, something, it's an appliance, you throw it away. So people are looking at classic cars. And if you think things are bad now, wait until giga casting becomes the norm of the industry. Because at that point, like literally nothing has any prospects for long-term survivability. That's just besides the point, we could do a whole separate video on, on giga casting and all of that. But based on those comments on the videos that we did, I sense a great growing interest in the idea of using a classic as daily transportation. So for some of us, like I've been around, I've been working on these cars not since they're classics. I've been working on these cars since they were new. So to me, there's, there's no mysteries involved in any of this stuff. But if you're just starting to get involved with see, the, the idea of using a classic as a daily is, is starting to, that bulb is going off in your head and you're thinking about sticking your toe in the water just to see how it's going to work out, I wanted to do a quick video, and this is by no means a comprehensive guide to the care and feeding of a classic car, but I wanted to do a quick video on concepts that may be useful to somebody who's considering this. Now, now this is important. We're not talking about getting into the collector car market. We're not talking about building race cars. We're not talking about muscle cars. Not, we're not talking about, you know, rare and desirable Barrett Jackson. No, we're not talking about anything like that. We're talking about using an older car, something from the, the previous era, as a daily driver and nothing more than a daily driver. It's the thing that's going to get you to school. It's going to get you to work. It's going to get you to the supermarket. It's going to carry the kids to the baseball game, wherever it is that you're going. Daily driver classic car. So I put together a list. I'm, I'm really not good at stuff like this, but I put together a quick list of, uh, of five points that somebody who's just looking to get into this might want to consider as they start looking for a car or putting these ideas together in their head. So I'm going to go through this list. It's five things in, in no particular order of importance. Um, but I, I think it'll give you a, a, a good starting point. And, and again, see, I have to go back and I have to say this again. This is not about building muscle cars or hot rods or race cars. This is about daily driver, okay? So let's start with this. And this is probably the most important thing, right? Choose your era wisely. All right. Now, when we're talking about classic cars, we're talking about stuff that was built, let's say, 20 to 25 years ago, all the way back to the 1800s. What era of classic car is going to fit today's modern world best run on the fuels that are available on the roads that are in current use at the speeds that are currently being used what era of classic cars get best going to fit so obviously a brass era car you know you're not going to a 1908 speedster isn't going to cut it right you have to look at the various eras of car and determine which one is going to fit your needs best so in my opinion for use in the modern world, 
you want to stick with post-interstate era cars. So they started building the interstates in the 1950s, and the system was complete in the 1960s. And cars went through a period of evolution there, from the 50s into the 60s, where they were designed to be better suited for long-term use at higher speeds. So cars designed from, let's say, the 1950s back were all designed for 40, 50, 60 mile an hour roads, a lot of two-lane stuff. Cars designed from the, 19, the early 1960s forward were designed for the realities of the interstate world, where a car is going to travel at 70, 75 miles an hour for hours and hours or days on end. So there was an evolutionary step between the 50s, the late 50s and early 1960s. I would say that the interstate era cars begin around 1962, 63, 64. By 1965, pretty much everything is up to the task of operating in the modern world. So I would say that that would be the early cutoff point. Yes, you can take a 55 Chevy or, and, and, and make it function, but we're talking about trying to keep cars stock and reliable, right? Stock and reliable, 1960s, early 1960s is about where you start. The cutoff end on the other side, I would say OBD2. Right around 1997, 1996, 97, 98, I would say is about your cutoff for really reliable and easily serviceable cars. They're survivable to that point. Um, now to that end, I've got a 64 Dart over there with a 170 Slant 6. That was my daily driver for 10 years. And that thing I put through, I mean, it, it did everything in the modern world that you could ask a car to do. And it was a completely mechanically stock car. Functioned fine. Lately, I've been driving XJs. I've got two of them, 298s. And they're of that late, the, the early OBD2 era. And again, see, they're manageable, they're survivable cars. Very simple electronics, easy to service. As far as like, now you want to, which between which era, between like the 1960s and the 1990s, you've got several other stages of automotive evolution that happen. So I would say that if ultimate simplicity and survivability and uh, ease of working is your priority, Cars built before the early 70s. Cars built before 72, 73. So cars, that 10-year period, between let's, let's call it 1963, 64 to 1973, 74. Those are going to be mechanically simplest cars that are capable of living in the modern world. 1970s, things start to get a little, middle 1970s, things start to get a little complicated. 1980s, you've got more of a reliance on electronics. They become a little more complicated. But still very survivable. Those cars from the 70s and the 80s all have their roots in the 1960s cars. So they are infinitely survivable, but they have a lot of the modern comforts that people have become accustomed to. So if you want power windows and cruise control and air conditioning, cars from the middle 70s through the 80s are your best bet. And again, that, that, that continues on through the 1990s. But I would say... 1980s, a 1980s car, the right one, will probably suit most of your needs. So focus on the era of car that embodies the virtues of the car that you value the most. All right. Uh, like I said, this is in no, no particular order. Um, try to stick with base models of popular performance cars. This is important because you have to understand the muscle car thing, the 1960s muscle car thing, has been popular now for 40 years. People have been restoring these cars. The cars are 50 years old, 50, 50 and 60 years old, but people have been restoring them for 35 or 40 years. So performance cars have a huge amount of aftermarket support, replacement parts. So, for example, if you're talking about a Chevelle, right? So an LS6 very desirable, very beautiful, very expensive and exotic car by today's standards, okay? But 
an inline six power glide Chevelle, the same body style, shares all of the rubber, all of the replacement stuff, the taillight lenses, and all of the things, the normal use things that go bad. And this holds true across the board. So, you know, if you're talking about Mopars, you know, a Plymouth Roadrunner is one thing. You don't really want to live with a Plymouth Roadrunner as your daily driver. But a Slant 6 or a 318 Belvedere has all of the same replaceable, you know, just replaceable stuff. And it's all very cheap, very accessible. To give you an idea how cheap and accessible this stuff can be if you pick the right car, I've got this Belvedere over here, a 67 Belvedere. And last night, I ordered all of the disposable brake parts. So I didn't order shoes or springs because I have that stuff now. But I ordered a new master cylinder, new front brake hoses, new front wheel cylinders, a rear brake hose, and the two rear wheel cylinders off a of Rock Auto. And my total cost for those parts, oh, and, and two dust covers for the, for the front hubs, my total cost on those parts was $96. $96 front to back and all that stuff is available because the B-Body Mopar of this era shares all of these parts with the popular muscle car, the, 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 the more, the more uh, collectible cars. So choosing, picking a low performance version of a popular high performance car puts you way ahead in terms of the parts that are going to be available to you, and the support network. You know, because if you've got, let's say, a 67 Belvedere like this, even if it's a Slant 6 or a 318 and it's a four-door and you're just going to drive it, there's still that kinship with the other Mopar people. So when you need a, a, a switch or a, a, a thing, whatever it happens to be, it's accessible. So you want to stick with stuff that has, that, that, let's say, the lesser cousins of bigger cars. You can't go wrong. All right. Um, the third thing I have on my list here is try to avoid modifications. There are reasons to keep everything factory when you're talking about a daily driver car. Now, it's not always possible. A lot of parts uh, have become obsolete over the years. So it's not always entirely possible to keep the car dead stock, but... For daily driver purposes, it's, your, it's always your best bet. It's the most reliable way to operate one of these cars. There's no second guessing. The engineers who designed these things were not dummies. They thought through every possible situation that these cars could be operated in, and they engineered it all into it. So now once you start modifying the car, now there are plenty of reasons to modify a car. You want it to be faster. You want it to do things that it wasn't supposed to do from the factory. That's great. But for daily driver purposes, for a best all-around package, I recommend leaving the things as stock as you possibly can. An example, so well, recently I had a, a guy that I know stopped by. He had, he had put a SERP belt conversion on a small block Chevy. And the idler pulley had gone bad. And he asked me if I, could, if I knew where I could get one of these idler pulleys. And he couldn't get one because that system had become obsolete. The manufacturer didn't offer that anymore. If he wanted to repair it using that manufacturer's parts, he had to change the whole system. For an idler pulley, see, you don't have that problem if you just stick with stock parts. That's why I recommend daily driver, leave it alone. You want a hot rod, you want a race car, you want that's great, but not for your daily driver. Keep it stock, keep it simple. And again, like the brake parts on this Belvedere, all of the stock parts are available. Um, number four, choose the car based on intended use, not popularity. So it's easy to get swept up in, you know, the beauty of certain cars or the, the mystique of certain cars or the performance of certain cars. But what are you going to use this thing for? You don't need a muscle car if you're just going to and from work. You don't want to have to feed it lots and lots of premium fuel all the time. You don't want to, you don't want to deal with the idiosyncrasies and the quirks that come with a high-performance car. So you want to choose a car that's going to be best, best for your use. If you're a family man, a four-door car, a four-door mid-size car is your best bet always. It's 
trust me when I tell you, you're not going to have the coolest car at Cars and Coffee, but you will be a standout in the supermarket parking lot. So pick the car or truck that best suits the use that you're going to put it through, not the most desirable model of them. Don't get caught up in that. Focus on what you're going to use the car for. And the last thing I have here is avoid orphan or less popular models. All right, now this is, again, we're talking about daily driver cars. So let's just say you, you love the Oldsmobile Toronado. You think that the 66 Toronado is just absolutely, this is the car you want. This is going to be your daily driver. Right? It's not a good idea. Not that the Olds Toronado isn't a fantastic car. Not that they're not beautiful cars. They're, they, they're a pinnacle of that era. But they don't make good daily driver cars. Because they're complicated and they have a lot of orphan parts. They have a lot of stuff that's only specific to that model. So instead of, let's say, a, a, a heater control system failure being a quick, simple fix as you'd find with a base model car, it's an elaborate thing. The same thing also. Cadillacs, Lincolns, uh, Chrysler, like Imperials. All of your high-end cars from that era, they're beautiful cars, and they make for fantastic collector cars and Sunday afternoon cars, show cars. That's the way to go. But they make terrible daily drivers. You want to stick with the base models, or as close to a base model as possible. The simpler the car, the more survivable it is, the more available the parts are going to be. So that's I mean, it's very important. People get, you get caught up in the hype. Orphan models, same thing. So you may find a great deal on, let's say, an AMC Ambassador, which are cool cars. I take nothing away from them. Or a Corvair, one of my favorite cars from the 1960s. I love Corvairs. But there isn't a lot of aftermarket support for them. There isn't, a, you can't just, you, the mechanical parts to keep them together the, the bread and butter parts aren't nearly as available as they are for more common cars, you know, pedestrian cars, Chevelles and so on and so forth, uh, mid-sized Mopars, uh, Falcons are great cars. Now, let's, let's talk about some examples of cars that I think would make fantastic classic car daily drivers that are like that middle of the road car. They're not the brutal simplicity of the 1960s, and they're not the high sophistication of the 1990s, but 1980s cars that would make for fantastic dailies. G-bodies. You can't go wrong with a G-body. There's so much support for those cars. They built so many of them. Parts are so available. The, the enthusiasts, there's a lot of enthusiasts. A Grand National will not make a great daily driver. You don't want to use it as a daily driver. But a V6 Regal or a, a, a 307 Regal, fantastic daily driver. You've got all of the aftermarket parts support that goes with the more exotic car, but you don't have any of the, uh, the, the real exotic parts to worry about or, or to deal with. Fox Mustangs or, or Fox, anything Fox body is another fantastic choice for a daily driver. You have to choose wisely. Right, so a f you look at Fox Mustangs, right? Yeah, a, a 302, a G, even a GT is a good daily driver. A four-cylinder Fox is an even better choice. Or let's say a six-cylinder Fairmont, excellent cars. But you gotta choose wisely because let's say you're talking about four-cylinder Mustangs, okay? So a four-cylinder Fox Mustang is, has, has every single thing you can imagine is available through the aftermarket. But then you get to, let's say, a four-cylinder SVO Mustang, and now you've got a lot of weird one-off exotic parts. Like, for instance, the TRX wheels. You can't get tires to fit the wheels on an SVO Mustang. They're 15.5. Don't ask me why they did that. You can't get tires for the damn things. It, it's little stuff like that. You know, you can't get controllers for, for certain things. Uh, you want to stay away from, like, Chrysler cars of the era, like the K cars, the Daytonas and whatnot, they were great cars. I had I had a bunch of them. I worked on them. There's nothing wrong with the cars themselves, but a lot of the stuff is not available. When the computer takes a dump, on, you know, the controller takes a dump on your 1987 Daytona, you can't just run to the parts store and grab one. The cars don't have a big aftermarket support. There aren't a lot of enthusiasts 
you know, supporting the, the movement of those cars. So something like a GOHS is a fantastic muscle car. You know, it's a fantastic uh, collector car. It could be a great hot rod, it could be a great cruiser. It's a terrible choice for a daily driver. And really, I, actually, any of those those K car based cars, not good choices for daily drivers. The parts to keep them on the road are not as available as, let's say, that '67 Belvedere. I can get anything I need for that '67 Belvedere off a of Rock Auto, but it's pick and choose when you've got a 1980s K car. So, just some things to think about, things to ponder. Nothing cast in stone, and I'll do more videos on this. There's anything, anything in this particular video that seems to spur a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, uh, interaction. I'll go further into those topics, but these are just things to think about if you're considering going into the world of classic cars as daily drivers. Again, not race cars, hot rods, muscle cars, collector cars. No, daily driver. You turn the key, go where you got to go. You know. Throw the key to your wife, she goes where she's got to go, no special care, no special treatment, no special gas, no special oils. These are the cars that you want to look at. There'll be more on this in the future, but I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.